it wasn't until well into your, your presentation did you go to yellow families. You left yellow families out for, for quite a while. Oh, you mean Asian Americans? Yes. If you, you, know, you use black term, white term, brown term. So I was just going to jump I was, in. I was just making sure. Just going to jump in there with you. Those making sure I Asian, understood. Asian distraction. Asian Americans. Uh, because their experience has been totally different than than many um, others that have come over. So, uh, so let, let's. Just, I'm just to look at, at at black families for a little bit, if I could. So, the poverty rate is is not. Um, we we don't like the poverty rate. None of us in here like it. So what. In 1960, let's just go to 1960, what was the poverty rate of a black family then? Um, it would have been, on a scale of wealth, significantly higher than it was today. The poverty rate of the poorest black families uh, would have been significantly higher, probably about a third higher than it is right now, a third to half higher. But, follow, follow up. It's interesting because the day that I've seen, the, the black family was much more intact and much more able to um, be together in 1960 than it, than it was uh, even 30 years later, 40 years later from that point on. In fact, some have asserted and, and have the data behind it that the black family 100 years after uh, slavery was doing better than 40 years after big government intervention of the 1960s. How would you comment on that? All right, when you say big government intervention, I guess you mean LBJ yes. and, and, and those pieces. Well, there's a distinction, right? It's in sort of an, an order of magnitude question. So the most pernicious poverty of the 1950s and 60s and the black families that were experiencing that were experiencing a type of subsistence poverty, right? They like, the, essentially many of those folks were subsistence farmers. Like my grandfather was a subsistence farmer in Alabama. These were people who were generally illiterate, um, generally had between six to 10 children um, and raised enough food to basically be able to survive, but not enough to be able to get it to market. So you're talking about people who were living in a level of poverty that in the modern era we don't see. So it's difficult to make an apples to apples comparison between those poverty scales. Um, but what we see, I think most consistently in the sort of, you're talking about my mother's lifespan, is that those communities that um, had the highest black populations and concentrations of, uh, of black uh, of, of black families. In those communities, we see significant disparities in their ability to have housing and for their housing to gain value. That's a government policy that was depressing the value of those people's houses through redlining, um, through other forms of blockbusting, through, of course, eminent domain um, claims that were in some case, were cases racially motivated um, in their reasoning. Those big government policies are really the ones that I'm referring to as actually producing the harm because those were the policies that made it impossible for those black families to take their wealth to market the same way that Asian American families or white families were not inhibited from doing. Um, it really is that distinction more than any other that I think is, is to bear for most of the difference in what we call the racial wealth gap. Because most of the wealth in the United States was accumulated with housing. So when you break that connection um, between a community's ability to have housing that gives families wealth, and that wealth providing education, providing security for families, nest eggs, uh, for them to be able to have housing for their kids, that distinction, more than any other, really statistically, uh, demonstrates the difference. Senator Rader. Thank you. Mr. Chair, excuse me. 